Good morning. We're going to talk about more kinetics today. But before we do so, let's jump into the questions from yesterday. What did we talk about yesterday? Um, folds and fold classifications. So what, I, so what I spoke about yesterday, and that you hopefully got a chance to study a bit, is kind of the reason, why do we observe the falls we observe? And the, my main uh, reason for going through that is that's going to be the preamble to understanding why do proteins fold in the first place, and what is that determined stabilization, which later is going to be what you use, for instance, if you want to design mutants, if you're going to be working with bioinformatics, if you're going to design, say, new biologicals, to try to bind to an arbitrary protein. What this is going to give you is basically a set of constraints that you have to follow. That if you're going to design proteins, you're going to need to think about these things. You will need to think about the stabilization. You will need to think about the hydrogen bonding and everything so that you don't just create random polypeptides. Because those are not going to work. So given that, let's get, let's run through the questions. Uh, I think there might be one or two here that I didn't explicitly mention, but that's a great, that's a great check both for me, in case it's something I should have mentioned, and second, it might be something that you should have been able to look up on the web otherwise. What's the main pre reason proteins are similar? What is your argument why that is true? Because there were two other alternatives. Um, the argument is that there, there aren't that many folds that are, have been. Uh, yeah, but they might all be related. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's all, all three of them. Sorry? I think all three of them. Okay. Yeah, but that's a, the, my, I'm a bit nastier. You're more than welcome to answer. You're more than welcome to pick any of them. But no matter which one you pick, I want a strong argument why that is true. So that, yes, you could certainly say that it's only a limited number of folds. But what is your argument why that is true? Or why that should be better than the others? So one possible explanation is, of course, that there are plenty of examples in the literature and the databases where protein obviously share the same fold but there is no functional relation whatsoever and there is no, rela um, there is no evolutionary relationship whatsoever. And from that argument, then it's, and it's also the fact that we can create brand new sequences that are completely artificial even, and get them to fit one of the existing folds. And since we created them, they were obviously not derived by evo evolution, right? So that the concept that the fold itself can stabilize the sequence and that we want to somehow target the fold, there is definitely a good argument why that is true. So do you want to have a go at the other? Does anybody else want to have a go at the other two? So what were the other two alternatives? Divergence. Mm -hmm. So let's pick one of them. Um, you pick divergence first. What type of divergence? You said, you said divergence or convergence, but uh, when we uh, say divergence, evolutionary. evolutionary divergence. So why, why is evolutionary divergence the main reason, an arguably good main reason why proteins are similar? Because they could possibly start from the same one single protein, then uh, you could do duplication and mutation. So that's not the, it's it's correct in principle, but same same thing here. Find the evidence. What is the evidence that if some if I disagree with you, what is your evidence that you're right? right. <laughs> not that it might be right, but that you are right. right. Hmm. And uh, that's an example of what. So we know in general in databases that protein domains that are evolutionary related, they always have the same fold. There's pretty much, 
there are artificial proteins, but there are, there are no examples when two domains that are homologous have different folds. It does not happen. So in the 1960s, my argument, counter-argument might have been good, but 40 years later, we know it does not happen. If they are related, they do share the same fold, period. Which so was not obvious, right? And in a, in a way, it's actually fun that we started to determine myoglobin and hemoglobin structures. Because when, we started, when people started working on them, it was not obvious that they would have the same domain. It's just a freak of nature. The third argument was what? Structural convergence. And what does that mean and why is that true? If there are two proteins that are similar in structure but they're not related in, in evolution um, and they carry out maybe a similar function and there's one fold or one structure that gives that function or that's very suitable for that function, then they, both, they are both similar even though there's no evolutionary relationship. Can you give an example of this? Yes, Rossmann, um, and no, actually, Rossmann fold is probably good. Um, because in particular, if you want the beta sheet, right, and you want it to be protected from water, so then have two binding sites or something. Um, so by definition, functional convergence is difficult because it's, by definition, it's not, if, if it was a family of proteins, they would be evolutionary related. So I think you kind of need to put it somehow on the fold level and argue that it's a very common structure that we see again and again. Um, the Greek keys is another example. Um, so it's the same super secondary structure at least, but there are no evolutionary relationship. And the, the point, the reason we're bringing up all those three, right, that the devil is in the detail or similar here, it's up to you. What aspect do you think is important? What way are you looking from this? This comes back to something that I, I touched upon this very briefly in the beginning of the course. If you compare in particular the argument that fold space is limited versus evolutionary divergence. That corresponds to two completely different ways of looking at protein structure. Do you remember which ones? I, I'm well aware that I only touched upon it briefly. I'm going to come back to this in the course. So the fact that it's only a limited number of folds that can be stabilized, that's very much a bottom-up view. That is based on physics, it's based on the stability of proteins, and it's a structural view. And that's perfectly correct. We need that view. The evolutionary divergence, on the other hand, is entirely based on bioinformatics. Or actually, I would say it's not even based on bioinformatics. Bioinformatics is the tools that we use to study it. But the key word is evolution. It is not based on structure. It is not based on the interactions of proteins. And we, we could even say that we know that it's too complicated to understand, but nature has had four billion years to figure it out. <coughs> and of course, they are not orthogonal because evolution the selection of the survival of the fittest part of evolution, of course, has to do with the stability. But when it comes to our studies of proteins, we can choose to either approach it structure-wise or evolution-wise. And which one you choose is going to be up to you. It depends. One, one method is not always better than the other. Uh, we spoke a little bit about uh, structural evolution yesterday, too. Can you give one example of this? Or two? Or three. Mm, that's actually a good one. I didn't specifically mention that. I think it's, 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 a, it's an awesome example. Because it, in bacteria, it's um, a similar or a channel is present, but it's open and closed by um, pH differences. Yeah. And then it evolves a um, different piece of the protein that is um, activated. So then you, then you took up another, a completely new domain, right, to get the more advanced uh, function. And then you could, that could, you could say you even have a functional evolution. Uh, the simplest case of structural evolution would probably be like llama hemoglobin or the fetal hemoglobin or something. Exactly the same protein, but a small change. But the channels, I didn't even think of the channels. Uh, awesome example. So what's the relation between structural and sequence evolution? So we don't necessarily design it. It's also a good question. We don't 
first, I would say that we haven't made a strict definition of it, but it's somehow, you could, uh, I don't wouldn't say that, you could of course argue that any time that you have an amino acid change or something, it's a slightly different structure, right? Um, that would not qualify as structural evolution in my view. So structural evolution would mean that the structure has changed so that the function changes. Because that the, the function is given by the structure, right? So that somehow it has evolved. So this was related to stuff I drew on the whiteboard yesterday. Right, and it, I might even have had some slide that almost looked incorrect <laughs> by now. Uh, so you have the sequence that led to the structure that led to the function, right? And occasionally we even draw some sort of arrow here and strike them out. Uh, because those arrows, the information doesn't go that way. But there is, of course, this part that you go back through natural selection. Not for an individual molecule, but for the species. There are some examples. I don't think I have a slide about this. I'll just mention it briefly. Normally, most changes we do are if they're good, you survive. If they're bad, you die. There are a few examples in the literature that where there have been freak changes that have survived anyway. And a great example of this is sickle cell anemia. Have you heard of it? So it's a small mute, it's a single site mutation in the hemoglobin. And if you get it in both alleles, you die. But if you only have this in a single allele, uh, what happens is that your hemo the hemoglobin uh, starts to aggregate the entire molecules, which is really bad. Um, and it's not at all as good as taking out oxygen. And um, what happens is that your entire red blood cells will collapse. So the blood cells, in the when you look at them in the microscope, they take on this almost like sickle-like shape. So why on earth would such a mutation survive? Yes? Right, so that with this, it, it doesn't create a 100% resistance to malaria, but for some freak of nature, this means that you're slightly more resistant to malaria. Sickle cell anemia doesn't occur in Sweden or the US, but it has made, it has, it has, it has in certain parts of Africa, this has become an evolutionary advantage. Because yes, you can't run that much, but you will survive. And in contrast to a lot of your peers, you don't die from malaria. So why do protein domains have the sizes they do? Now that's quite right. Um, and I would say it's not just a matter that it would take too long to fold, uh, but the, the entropic loss of packing, we'll come back to that today, but a protein that is free has very high entropy, right? And if you have a very large chain that's free, that's even better entropy-wise. And if you take a very large chain and need to pack this entire specific chain in one specific chain in one specific way, that's an even larger entropy loss. So they would not even be that stable. Um, Sorry, that wouldn't even be stable at all. So protein domains, you might have talked about protein domains from the bioinformatics view, I hope. Uh, so, but there is also this concept that you need some sort of basic size of the fundamental building blocks of proteins, even functionally. They're not going to fold if they're too small or too large. Sequence fold fitting. I didn't use that word yesterday. I'm well aware of that. But it's related to something. Can you imagine what it was? I talk about this multitude principle also. Was it that some folds are more, of, are more, I mean, can be taken by more of greater variety of sequences, whereas others are more restricted into which? Right, so that common folds that don't have any defects, they will be able to accommodate lots of sequences. They're liberal. 
while very specific folds that have very awkward features, they will require very special amino acids in that specific position. And that means that there are going to be much fewer sequences that fit them. So the, the reason for bringing this up, and I will come back to that towards the end of the lecture today, that in general, the likelihood that a, pro, a random sequence will fold a protein is nil. It won't happen. So if you're going to, ever going to be tasked with designing, say, a new biological, some sort of molecule that should bind to a random receptor, you can't start from sequence. I'm sorry, but that you're going you're gonna to fail. If you try to create 100 amino acids and create some sort of function from it, maybe in 100 years, but today it's not going to happen. We can't, you can't design a function directly from amino acid sequence. But what you can say, I would like to create a binding site for, I would like to create a binding site that's going to bind to some receptor, say like the ribosome in this particular location. And I would li like to do this with a small protein. And then you need to start thinking. Think, can you do this with 3,4 alpha helices or a beta sheet? Look at a suitable fold in the literature. Borrow that fold and then create a sequence that will A, adopt that fold, and B, have amino acids in the right place to create a binding site where you want it. But do not try to start directly from 100 amino acids and create function directly from that. We can't do it. And neither can nature. So that, that depends. It's a bit related to this thing that I said, right? right? Uh, the accommodating folds, they, have, they usually have a better, easier way to accept lots of amino acids because it's not that specific. Um, so assuming that you have an alpha helix, uh, roughly 50% of the residues are happy to be alpha helical. So if you, now, if you have a simple, say, four helical bundle, and then I need a reason, well, I need something that's hydrophobic here. As long as it's hydrophobic and likes to be an alpha helical shape, you will likely be fine. On the other hand, if you have the same type of structure that you need a very tight beta turn there, then you basically need glycine. You can't pick anything that's large and hydrophobic. Tryptophan would not fit there. And this is actually what's used in particular in Rosetta, but most programs today that you use in practice to try to design proteins. And, and do be aware, we are doing protein design nowadays, uh, in particular in biologicals and pharmaceutical companies. But that always happens by pick a target fold first and then try to design in a new, new function in that structure. So what's the typical stabilization free energy of a protein? One or two exactly. Um, and that might be, I use that as an example. For a large one, it might be just so slightly larger. But the point, a handful of hydrogen bonds, maybe three, four not 50 hydrogen bonds. That is too something that I mentioned much earlier on in the course. What, why can't this, this seems stupid, because this means that they're going to be fragile, right? Why don't, why do not think nature has created a stabilization in the proteins to be 100 hydrogen bonds? That would make them much less fragile. Right, and every single protein that your body produces, you will have to break down a month later or so, or a few months later. So that would be inefficient. So that you want, you want something that's a bit stable, and it's not just where a month later. In some cases, there are proteins misfold. And if proteins misfold, you're going to need to pay to take care of them, right? So that this, too, has been something that has been balanced over billions of years, that proteins should only be stable enough, not too stable. And the other hunch I have about this, as I mentioned yesterday, that we're, we're more and more looking at proteins moving between different conformations. We're learning much more about the dynamics of proteins. Uh, and there was a great paper in Biophysical Journal yesterday, I think, where they're now using cryo-EM to try to study how proteins move. But if proteins were too stable, they wouldn't move, right? They would just create hard bricks that fly through the cell, and they couldn't really do a whole lot of their function. Uh, however, these stabilizations of proteins, while it looked like a Boltzmann distribution, we arrived at the conclusion that it's not primarily governed by the Boltzmann distribution. Why?
Yes, uh, that's a bit, this is not something at equilibrium. We don't have an equilibrium between different sequences in a protein. You pick your sequence and then we have to live with it. And that also means that in particular we don't really have the KT term. We can't really change the stability that much of a protein by adjusting KT. Different sequences would have, they might have different folding temperatures or something, but it's not something that changes for a protein. We also spoke about the typical sizes of helices and sheets. And in this case, I'm not, I think I've done the, the experiment a couple of times. Do not try to answer this in one sentence. Break it apart. And don't assume that the answer to this is only what we talked about yesterday. So what determines the size of helices and sheets? So membrane is one example. You know, uh, let's, let's wait a second with the membrane proteins because the globular ones, it's a, it's a great point actually, but let's start with the globular ones where we don't have the membrane protein complication. So what determines the size, say, of an alpha helix? Uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. And what does that determine? Does it, well, I'm, I'm not quite happy with the answer that it determines the length. Mm. So do you have another suggestion? Or? So now we're getting there. This provides an upper limit to the length of a helix. So they break it apart. But that is only half of the story, right? Because it's not that helices can have any length below that. Yes? So layers, that would rather be how many helices you have. Yep. So that you need to cross, so the, and that's what I meant that some of these questions are not quite trick questions, but it doesn't necessarily correspond to only what I mentioned yesterday. If you want to determine the size of the helix, size has to do with there is both a lower size and an upper size. The lower size is determined exactly by the thing you mentioned here, that if the helix is too short, we would only be paying the cost of the free energy barrier. You need to get across this free energy barrier, and then you need to extend it far enough that the total free energy is below zero. Otherwise, it would be a net negative to form an alpha helix. So there is some sort of shorter length that might be a turn or two, a few turns actually. Uh, and, we, uh, and that's even with the, the argument we had that uh, you need uh, roughly three, four hydrogen bonds to get over this barrier, right? And then you need, say, if you gain one or two k uh, kcals per residue, you put there, let's say, five, ten, uh, five, ten residues or something. You're, not, you're hardly ever going to see an alpha helix that is just one turn. So there is a lower limit to the size that you're not going to be stable if you're too short. And the other argument, there is also an upper limit to the size, and that has nothing to do with the free entity. If you have 100 residues that prefer to be alpha helical, they will be alpha helical. And there are examples like this. And I'm actually sitting with my I said all yesterday and worked on a protein like that in the bacteria. Uh, but they're going to be rare. And the reason why they are rare has to do with this probability. It's simply not that likely to randomly select 100 residues after each other that are all alpha helical. But if that's not that likely, why do they occur? Because it's not a random. Exactly. Uh, that, okay, sometimes in evolution, for instance, the hair, the fibrous proteins, right? Then you just have a small repeating gene segment. Uh, and in other cases, there is a very special function where you really need a long alpha helical, alpha helix. And the argument is, uh, this argument is not really different between helixes and sheets. So what is GFP? Mm, it's a beta sheet protein, uh, largely. And what do you have inside the beta sheet? Sorry. 
So that in terms of this question, it's exactly the same, right? Uh, because I didn't go into the details. Um, there is a lower limit to the structure, and the lower limit to the length of the structures has to do with that you need to get across this barrier. The barrier is slightly different. In alpha helices, it has to do with getting the hydrogen bonds from at least one turn, maybe a little bit more. In beta sheets, it usually had to do with that you need at least these two strands to form the first hairpin, right? And exactly whether it's one point strand or it might need 1.5 strand, that's going to depend on the specific properties of the amino acids. But there is, you need to have enough of residues involved so that you have gotten to the point where it's actually better to be in the secondary structure than not to be in the secondary structure. The other argument that we made more yesterday is that to be a beta sheet, you then need to put a, a certain number of units. And these units were... The point of the derivation I made yesterday was not that it should be exact, right? But the point was just to make this probability argument, and it, the probability argument works. You are right within an order of magnitude. We were even better than that. Uh, we had to somehow say, well, what is the unit? And then I hand waved that the unit was roughly three or four in a helix, and maybe two in a sheet. Full disclosure, it's hand waving. Uh, the point is that it's not 500 units. So that we get, and based on that probability reasoning, we got this argument that you might need in the ballpark of 10, 15 residues in a helix. You might need in the ballpark of 10 residues per strand for them to be stable as a beta sheet. And that corresponds, it was a little bit low, but it corresponds within a factor of two at least to the secondary structure elements we see. But that fundamentally it's not difference between helix and sheets. It's just that the repeat, I, and you could certainly argue that my argument about three versus two there was not quite correct. That brings us to GFP. So GFP was this small protein where you had sheets around it and a helix in the middle. But what is it useful for? Yes? Mm -hmm. And this is part of a... So the, the point with GFP is that it's something... There are, there are lots of fluorescent markers, right, and everything in the world. Um, and there is a fast, well, chromophores and thing. The problem with most of these things, the second you have something in a test tube, it's easy to do anything. But the hard part of you doing biotech is that at some point you need to get something in the bio part. You need to get it into a living organism. And this is not unique to fluorescence. There are tons of places where this happens. I would like to get something in a mouse or a long-term human or something. But if I want this to end up in your cancer cell, sorry, I can't eject it in every cancer cell in your body. That If I could do that, I would know what cells are the cancer cells, and I could just cut them out. So the problem is usually I would need the body itself to create something. And GFP is a way that we can genetically cause, well, either we can cause a model organism such as a mouse or something to express a protein where we can get things to fluoresce, or we can tag up the green fluorescent protein, which is a fluorescent marker with a custom antibody or something. And then we can get these antibodies to bind into a specific target cell. There are other similar proteins, not related to GFP, but uh, <coughs> one thing that has become exceptionally hot the last few years and that I think is going to be a future Nobel Prize is optogenetics. Do you know what it is? Optogenetics. So it's a point we would like to control ion. So this actually came up from a bunch of research groups that were working with ion channels and wanting to understand ion channels first. And then they came up with a way to add domains to ion channels so that when we shine strong light on it, it will open the channel. And what you can then do is that this has turned to an exceptionally expensive research field. So then you can then create a rat brain or something and you cut it open. And then if you shine a laser on this, you can alter the cellular signaling in the brain of the rat while it's alive. So you can basically you can steer the nervous system with the laser. Now the problem, and th this is super cool, um, and um, it's, a, it's an amazing tool just as DFP, and that's why I think it's going to get a Nobel Prize in a few years. Yehud Isakov could be a white candidate. There's one problem with this, though. You need to cut the rat's brain open because you need to shine a laser on it. And I'm not sure about you, but if you ever want to do this for a patient, that's... Mm. <laughs> so what the holy grail here could be, could you do this type of studies non-invasively? so that you would not have to cut it open. So Anna Moroni and several other groups are working on doing this with uh, magnetogenetics. So can you create protein domains that are sensitive to magnetic fields? So you could steer them with a very strong external magnet or something. 
And there are similar cases. There are small domains called ferritin domains. Uh, so that proteins that bind iron and everything. And same thing there. If you can express this in the genome, we have a vehicle by which to get it into cells. When this is into cells, the entire protein will bind iron. The protein domain will bind iron. And if it's binding on iron, it's going to be magnetic. And then we can control it. But basically, so it's a bit of parenthesis. But the reason I mention this is that this is kind of the most normal strategy if you want to get advanced things into cells nowadays in biotech. Allosteric modulation is what? Yes? Mm -hmm. And you can even make this even more generic. It's when there is some sort of secondary mechanism that alters the efficiency of the primary mechanism. So the point they, and I, it's probably easy to think about in terms of ligand binding. The allosteric modulator molecule can't cause, for instance, the ion channel to open. So it's like an amplifier. Just having an amplifier will not make music out of the speakers, right? But the point is that if you have a just having, say, the, well, ever, the Spotify app, I guess, is nowadays not a record anymore. Uh, but the record itself, the volume from the record is going to be too low. So you need the amplifier to create a high volume of the speakers. But you're not going to be happy without, you need the source. So that the original record or CD or Spotify app, that is the primary process, and the amplifier is the allosteric modulator. Although allosteric modulation in some cases can also dampen the effect, which happens in our ion channels. This too is a central concept of not all, but a very large part of modern drug design. Because we, most, we usually try to modulate processes. The reason for that is that in many cases, ion channels, for instance, shutting something off, it's easy. Just plug a pore or kill a protein, whatever. Bind something to the protein that it can't do its function. Given how fragile biology is, it's fairly easy to destroy biology. But the point is, we usually don't want to destroy a mechanism completely. You might want to dampen it just a bit or enhance it just a bit. And the enhancement part is even more difficult, right? That you can never enhance if, for whatever reason, some process in your cell is not active enough. We would like to stimulate it. And you can't stimulate it by shutting off a binding site. So there is more and more modern pharmaceutics and everything that is really based on allosteric. And I think it should have been a Nobel Prize, but it never got one. Then we spoke a little bit about folding units of a protein. So what was a folding unit? Well, there, yes. Uh, yeah, there, there. Yes, that's right. Uh, it was not the answer I looked for. It's quite right, of course. Uh, I was more thinking of the concept of a folding unit. And the concept of the folding unit is that how much stuff do you need for the protein to start folding? And you could imagine one example came. We've actually seen some counterexample of this. Um, the helix coil equilibrium in a long, in a long, long, long coil. And if we don't really worry about real proteins, if you worry about do the helices form. And in that case, you can certainly add one residue at a time to helix. So then you can continuously start folding, and there is no cooperativity whatsoever. Proteins in general, they are cooperative, though. You can't just fold one residue. It's not that. It's a beautiful model. You could think of a protein as it comes out of the ribosome, it would fold one residue at a time. It doesn't happen that way, sadly. So proteins in general, you need larger parts of the protein to fold. And we're going to talk about that on Monday, because that's part of cracking Leventhal's paradox. And in, some, in the opposite end, you could imagine that there are some structures, not necessarily individual protein, but like these plaques in the amyloid diseases or something, they're not going to form unless you have thousands of proteins like it. And in that case, the sum of the folding unit would be much larger than a protein. But what we ended up arguing is that in most cases, the folding unit has to do with these domains, which is, again, it's not a freak of nature, but they correspond exactly to the domains you see in bioinformatics. Why? Why is a more important question than how do we know? We'll answer the how do we know in a second. Um, 
they function independently and it's also it's supported. This relates so closely to bioinformatics and when we think bioinformatics, what should we think of? Evolution, right? Evolution evolves in domains, not in helices or anything. And if you start to think about random evolution, mixing that happens in your DNA and everything. Evolution, there are of course examples where single site mutations <coughs> happen and everything. Things like if you expose an organism to lots of radioactivity, you're going to have problems with single nucleotides being replaced and everything. But in general, that's not how DNA works. The reason why you're not, the reason why two siblings, for instance, are not identical copies of each other, it's not that there were some individual amino acids that were swapped. It's that you have enzymes that cut out entire parts of your genome and randomly mix entire domains. Yes. I would say yes, because this is also very much part of evolution, right? Um, so this has to do with the physical stability of the proteins and the entropy. But here too, if you had some domains that were too large, evolution would say that those are unfavorable and they're going to cost too much energy. They're not good. Evolution would try to get rid of them. Uh, in this case, same thing here, that the folding units has to do with the folding units if, you try, if the proteins had to fold residue by residue, it would not be efficient. Or conversely saying that if evolution happened by randomly knocking out individual amino acids, it would, evolution would be inefficient. And I know I'm so well aware that I haven't told yet, but again, you will, trust me, I will tell you at the end of this lecture, the likelihood of a random sequence forming a protein is zero. And if you now had evolution, and it's evolution and the random... Uh, than uh, happen by randomly changing amino acids in your genome. You would never succeed. Like 99, well not 99, uh, all, any, any change you could imagine in your genome would lead to a fetus that couldn't survive. We wouldn't exist. So evolution only works by the fact that most evolutionary changes are okay. They might not lead to any advantage and then that it might not survive over dozens of generations. But if things were so fragile that an individual amino acids, and remember the defects I said here, right? If you're unlucky and do one bad amino acid change, you would have destabilized the entire protein. So evolution would not work unless you try to reuse some sort of complete building blocks. So how do we know that? I went through that a little bit quick at the end. <clears throat> where if you start to denature a protein, you see that it's domain by domain, it's like all or nothing, it's not that it slowly uh, denaturates. It's like so the, the fundamental, yeah, that's quite right. So the, the fundamental concept here is that you need to find two ways to describe something, two different ways. And if we know that they describe the same thing, we can find ways that we say they must be equal. And then we can connect these two ways together. And one obvious thing is that we know how much energy it takes to, fold, uh, to melt the protein. Because that's the amount of energy I need to add. And I also know how much protein I have in a test tube, right? So I can calculate how much energy I need to add per molecule to melt it. And then I, we hand-waved our act note. I actually did prove it, although it was fairly quick, that from the shape of this curve, what happens when we denaturate a protein and the temperature interval over it happens, I could also make some estimates of the efficiency from these curves. So, and the reason why this works is that these curves describe how cooperative the process is, that it happens over a very narrow temperature range. But because the curves, they describe roughly how cooperative is the process, and then it turned out that here too I could get some estimates from the probability of folding, and then when I equated this and did a bit of math, uh, I could end up with roughly how much energy am I spending per folding unit. But since I also know how much energy I'm spending per protein, then you can say, ah, the folding unit corresponds roughly to the domains. So the point here is not so much that you deriving that particular equation, but find two things that describe the same thing, one from a fundamental physical point of view and the other one from the lab point of view. Then you can connect the two together. How does enthalpy and entropy change upon folding? I didn't really go through that in detail. I'm going to spend a little bit of time to talk about it. Uh, and you know what, let's wait with that for today. Uh, 
What is cold denaturation? So here too I would approach this in a couple of steps. Um, if you look at the shape of these free energy curves and you balance the, uh, the en energy with the entropy, you end up with harmonics, right? That, that you, have, you have some sort above a certain, sorry, they're not going to be straight lines, but it's basically it's like a second order curve. So that it has a slope that's changing. And while there is a higher temperature above which we are no longer stable, that's the normal denaturation of your bold things. In general, there's also going to be a lower, sorry, I'm drawing this from the right point. In general, there's going to be a lower temperature below which we are no longer stable either. In general, we won't see that because ice freezes and the water freezes and things stop moving before we hit that temperature. But the concept, again, that all processes, they have some sort of relatively, not just narrow, relatively, very narrow temperature range where they are favorable or stable. Then it just happens so that Cold denaturation for normal proteins, your body doesn't happen that much. But in general, this is important because anytime you're going to try to design things, you need to think of a target temperature. And if you're going to design things from the body, your target temperature should likely be around 37 degrees centigrade, right? You don't want to design a protein that is where you have the maximum efficiency, say, at 20 degrees centigrade. And even that 10% difference in temperature can matter. For now, this might seem like a freak if you're, uh, that's only important if you're studying fish in the Antarctic or something, but it's going to be important later today. Was there anything else you wanted to talk about, or should we get started with today's stuff? All right, let's head on. So today we are, I'm going to speak a little bit about the kinetics, what happens when proteins fold and unfold, and we're going to get back to look at this molten globular state. Uh, but now we're actually going to define the molten globular in much more detail. Uh, side chain packing, we're going to talk about what is really that stabilizes the energy at the end. And then you're going to be looking a bit at energy gaps. Um, so the lab yesterday, that was, sorry, yeah. The handouts, oh, I think we have them here. Uh, uh, Denature state, pass those down. <laughs> The lab, you made the lab, the lab yesterday was on what? Folding. Folding, okay. Uh, that might actually be related to the energy gap stabilization. Otherwise, you're going to do that as the next lab. We are gradually going to speak more about folding kinetics. And that's not just because we're going to, it's going to be a bit more of equations. But the point is that it turns out, this far we talked a lot about the Boltzmann distribution and the energy is important. But for real proteins, the speed with which things happen is frequently a much more important factor. And we will start relating this much more to, to Leventhal's paradox and argue when proteins are stable and why the kinetics is the answer to whether we can fold proteins in the first place. We're going to speak a little about chaperones, transition states, um, folding rates is something that's going to come up. And uh, I have two slides on chevron plots, but otherwise that's going to be the main topic for Monday. So we talk about a bunch of different states here. Um, I might even draw them here. And there are some common symbols that we so should explain, but I likely won't explain them in all cases. There is one state that we typically use N for. What type of state is that? Native. That's the native state of a protein. And I think the, the good answer, answer, the native state is well defined. The native state is when we have the biological efficiency. And then you have some sort of state that we frequently called D or U, completely unfolded. So D would be denatured and U would be unfolded. You can use any term you want for it. Um, but the point is that it's not really that well defined. What you will frequently see in books is that you will see some sort of chain that looks that way. And as you know now, that's wrong. In general, a change won't be stretched out. But it's going to be some sort of random jarn. So there, there is no structure whatsoever in it anymore. 
And then somewhere we have this state that we don't really have a letter for, but I will use the letter M for molten globular. And that's some sort of intermediate. There is, ah, it's not quite up there, but it's not really native either. And I'm sorry that I can only apologize for a generation of researchers here is that we haven't been better at defining these. But when I was your age, the molten globular, we thought that that was almost up there, but not quite. But we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at particularly in that state. Um, because the problem is that if you're now going to fold protein, at some point you start out here, right? And there is some sort of transition. Do we go there first? And do we then go there? That's actually going to turn out to be true, but I haven't proven that this far. So this first step moving from denatured to molten globular, this is the part where we're now arguing it was kind of just a hydrophobic collapse. Turn all the hydrophobic stuff to the inside and keep the charges on the outside. Or at least that's what my generation thought. Uh, it's going to turn out that it's not quick, uh, quite true. But the real protein folding is going to be the second step. But to understand this, we're going to need to look a little bit more about the molten globular and what it is. Uh, so if you want to try to reproduce this in the lab, if you are at good low temperature and no yucky stuff such as guanidinium hydrochloride, guanidinium hydrochloride, guanidinium ions, that's, that's a side chain of arginine. Uh, and it's, it's, you're basically adding two or three molars of a very, very strong acid here. So that's a classical denaturant you want if you want to make sure that the protein is completely stretched out. Or at least not stretched out, but there is no secondary structure or anything. So at natives, if you don't have any denaturant like that, and if you have low temperatures, we are going to be, there is some sort of domain or range here where you are native. If you just increase the temperature a bit, we will gradually move over to some sort of molten globular state. This looks quite a lot like a protein still. And if you really want to destroy things and start adding guanidinium hydrochloride, eventually you end up with something that's coil-like and completely unfolded. But there are these three different regions. So what we know now, in particular because we can do, NM, the problem with the molten globular, you can't determine the structure of the molten globular because it's not periodic and it's not well defined. But we can use things like NMR. Uh, we know that the main chain is quite ordered. And here's where we went wrong in my generation. Sorry, that it's not the fact that it's just a random hydrophobic collapse. You do have the rough shapes of the main chain or something. They will form quite quickly. Uh, we definitely have the hydrophobic core, though, and it's dense in the sense that there is not a whole lot of water in it. There's a little bit of water in it, but the protein is roughly like a sphere, and it's just pushed out most of, most of the water. So the volume is also roughly what it should be of the final protein. Uh, however, it's not yet in the native state. So there is going to be some sort of transition to the native state that we don't know yet what it is, the second part. So it's not that we are, it's not like it's exactly the native state. It's clearly not native and it's clearly not the native state. Uh, the definition, if you move from this molten globular up to this coil, that's much less well defined. So it's that if you just start adding things here, you can al go almost continuously here. But here there is going to be some sort of energy barrier between. Them. And if you define a bunch of things that it's compact and it has a well hydrophobic core just as a native protein on the other hand it's not a rigid structure and we know that partly because we can't crystallize it but you can also see in an nmr experiment that it's it's very flexible and mobile and today you could do it with the simulation too it is like the native protein in the sense that we usually have secondary structure the helices have started to form the beta sheets have started to form they might not be exactly like they're going to be in the final structure, but it's not just a random mix of hydrophobic things on the inside. On the other hand, compared to the native state, it has, it has, the transition has happened. There isn't really any second sort of phase transition up here or anything. So that's we, the magic that happens here is gone. We might start to see that the side chains have become ordered and they, they might have tried to start packing. Uh, and we'll come back to the side chains. However, there is not a unique packing yet. It's not well defined. And that has to do with this rigid structure. It's still floppy and flexible. And the disulfide bridges might have started to form at least, but this is not yet a working protein. 
And what you can, no, you might not be able to guess it here, but what I will argue is that any sequence you make, create a random sequence of 100 polypeptides, they're going to form something like a molten globule. So there will be a spherical shape, but there is no magic. There is no protein yet. We'll come back to the magic in a few slides. Uh, you can, there are a bunch of structures to determine this. NMR spectroscopy is one of them. You can also do this type of laser spectroscopy where we capture time dependent structures at very high resolution. And oh, this is probably not a good example, but if you do this as a function, you, the scale here is goes from zero to roughly three milliseconds. So that even here earlier, you gradually see things sharpen up a bit, but you can also see that there are lots of alpha helices here and everything. So while the structure is forming, we already have a whole lot of secondary structure. This is another example uh, where it's a snapshot from something that looks molten globular like in a simulation. And if you think about this in terms of packing, if this is the native state where we have beautiful, well-defined packed things in the interior, the molten globular corresponds to stirring this up a bit, heating for instance. So if you take your beautiful protein and then heat it to 50 degrees centigrade, it's not going to be shattered to pieces. But suddenly there is a bit of water, the side chains have started to move. Again, the magic is gone, but it still looks like a protein, roughly like a protein at least. What I'm going to argue, and that we will come back to likely after the break, is that this part is really good at what's going to correspond to these transitions. When you get the final packing in order, when you push out the water and everything, that's what's going to be the protein folding. While almost any protein can form something like that. So having said that, what we're going to start to look a bit is this transition. If we start to denature state and then go down to the molten globular. So what is required to move from a denative, sorry, from a un unfolded or denatured, or you can even say non-native uh, state, to a molten globular? Well, it's partly the cytophobic collapse, right? Can you imagine anything else that's important to get there? I said that almost all proteins. So rather, what's specific with proteins? Why, can't, why, don't, why don't any type of small molecules do this? If you have a mix of hydrophobic and hydrophilic stuff. After all, there's a ton. Amino acids are not the only molecules that can be either hydrophilic and hydrophobic and have a bit of different properties. So what's special with proteins? Mm. So I'm going to, it's always hard to do the math first. I'll do the math first because otherwise it's, proteins are homopolymers. Uh, and this might sound like, yeah, I didn't know that. Homopolymers means that they are polymers and they're polymers. Proteins in general are heteropolymers. But if we start looking at the simplest possible case, they are polymers. And the polymer part here means that they consist of several residues or monomers stitched together. And uh, sorry, I was wrong. Proteins in general, of course, are not homopolymers. They're heteropolymers. But let's forget about the hetero for a second. If you imagine a, there is a famous term in physical, Gedanken experiment. So this is an experiment that we can't do, but we can't think about it. So imagine the case if proteins were not in a chain. They were just small random molecules. Because most molecules in the world are not connected. What I'm going to argue, the second you start to pack molecules, unless there is really bad clashes, the more densely you pack things until you get to a density of roughly one, it's going to be good for them to interact because it's a condensed phase and atoms like to interact. But that doesn't really depend on whether you're connected or not. But what is going to depend on the, whether you're connected or not is the entropy. Um, so the energy as you're going, so if we don't know the volume or the number of residues, we can think of this in terms of density on the x-axis. And as the density is lower, you're stretched out. And as you're folding up, the density starts to approach something like one. And I would argue that the energy just goes down. Let's have a look at what happens to the entropy. So one way is that we can think of something that's cloud-like, that the amino acids can be anywhere they want in space. Then you have the volume, the accessible volume to each monomer. That's going to correspond to the volume that has not yet been taken by something else, right? And if you are in a cloud, 
then, well, the volume that I can move as a monomer, that's going to be the total volume available minus, let's see, I think I might have some notes there. Yes, minus the number of monomers I have multiplied by the volume per such monomer. And then I wanted the, den uh, the, uh, the volume per monomer. So then I should divide by the number of units here to n. This is a bit of an ugly expression because I need to know how many monomers I have and I need to know what the total volume is. And I don't really know any of those. So what I then tried to do, since I wanted these x-axis where I just spoke about the density from 0 to 1, I know that the density I have, well, that's the number of monomers multiplied by the volume per monomer divided by the total volume, if I want something that goes between 0 and 1. And if I just use that equation, I can rewrite this a bit. Uh, so the first term there would be v divided by n. So the v divided by n minus the second term, which is pretty much uh, n times omega divided by n. And then I use the equation down there a second time, and then I get rid of that n too. You can do the math if you want to. But basically, you end up with an equation that's a function of the density per monomer, that's constant. Oh, sorry, the volume per monomer, that's constant, and the density. But it's not just proportional to the density. It's some constant divided by the density multiplied by 1 minus the density. The exact shape is not important, but it's a complex function of the density. While if you're a chain, well, a chain can't be stretched out or anything, right? So if you're looking locally at the chain, there is going to be some sort of constant volume, which is the volume around my segment. And then I guess the neighbor before me is busy and the neighbor after me is busy. So there's going to be some sort of constant shape around me that I can't access. And at this point, you probably start to what on earth is going through all this math again. Um, so, but in a, the point is that the dependence of the available volume per monomer is different in a chain from what it would be in a cloud if they were completely disconnected. But we also know that we can calculate the entropy, right? As course, that's proportional to the logarithm of this amount of volumes or states available. And if you just do that, take the logarithm of either 1 minus rho or the logarithm of rho multiplied by 1 minus rho, we end up with very different shapes. So in general, if you're disconnected monomers, you're going to start, if you're fully packed, in both cases, we have very low entropy. In the, uh, in the limit where we're perfectly packed, the entropy is zero. But as you start to unfold the chain, we will get more and more entropy. We, the, sorry, the, the entropy goes up most when we give a little bit of freedom to the protein because there are many more states that are available. And as you gradually unfold the protein, that grows more and more. But remember, in this case, there was no chain. So what will happen? What would be, if things were not connected, what would be the way they had the most entropy and freedom? Spread out all over the universe, right? So that as the density here goes to zero, the entropy would raise infinitely. If this was a protein, what this would mean is that up in this state, you would go to infinitely high entropy. But then you also know your classical equation, right? F equals E minus TS. If S starts to approach plus infinity here, F would approach minus infinity. So if things were not in a chain, it would always be best to be unfolded. And the reason for the equation on the last slide is that when you have this rho times 1 minus rho, this means that the entropy will still go up, but then we will approach a constant value. So because you are in a chain, once you reach the state where the chain is completely stretched out, you can't get higher entropy. And that suddenly means that the entropy up here would be finite. And because the entropy here is finite, that means that the free energy is also going to be finite. And that means that it might actually be possible to create something down here that's better. So it's not just a coincidence that proteins, because if proteins were not chains of molecules, there is no way they could fold. Because with, for any, uh, any other non-connected molecules, it would be better to be infinitely far apart. 
And that's actually not limited to proteins. That has to do with plastics or anything. And that's why anything that's plastic or bags or something, they're polymers. You would not get the molecules to be stable in some sort of folded up state unless it's connected as a chain. So it's important that proteins must be, proteins were not polymers, they could not exist. They would not even be able to fold a molten globule. It would be happier to be spread apart. Let's see. Uh, sorry. You can even do this math. If we take those curves in the last slide, this was just the entropy. And then I also said that the energy goes down pretty much linearly, right? So if we just apply the energy minus that entropy, you're going to end up with free energies that looks like that in a cloud and like this in a chain. So in a chain, you're going to have some sort of minimum in free energy, fairly close, not necessarily where rho is exactly equal to 1, but at a fairly high density. While here you might have a local minimum, but it would be even better to be completely unfolded. So rho equals to 1 would just means that things are packed so that the protein is perfectly packed. So that, that would mean that there is no water around it or anything. We've taken all the residues and packed them perfectly in space. So no, but it's squished together. So we haven't started to talk about what fold means yet. All I had said that, if you take any type of molecules, and again, we're still talking about homopolymers here. If you take any type of molecule, and if they are connected in a chain, there will be some stored states when we have squished them together that depending on the temperature, we will end up with some sort of local minima in free energy here. And you can probably guess what that will correspond to later on. But this term, is, we're not talking about proteins here. We're just talking about polymers. If things are not polymers, we're going to end up with different things here. So proteins don't really have, at least not first plain first order phase transitions. If things were not polymers, you would end up with something much more similar to water, right? And water or anything else, at some point you're going to boil them and then it's much better to be out here. Sorry, yeah? The no first so that the first order phase transition here would correspond that you have a clear barrier, right? And when you get across that barrier, you move over to some, a different state. And there is no clear... In this particular case, again, it's a simple polymer. There is not an obvious, there is no simple barrier here. We will have barriers later on, trust me. Uh, this was just polymers. We're going to ditch the homo in two slides here. Uh, on the other hand, we also need these free energy barriers. And the reason for that, if you don't have the free energy barriers, what was, sorry, let me go back to the last slide again. What would happen here if we didn't have a free energy barrier? While this might be the best state, we could gradually go up here, right? Just add a little bit more. If you add epsilon energy, I'm going to move epsilon away from that. And this would be bad because you would not be stable. You would not be well defined. All your hemoglobins, if you go into the sauna, your proteins would gradually start to unfold in within minutes and everything. So you don't have the stability. If I poke you, you would start to die and you might be unstable. So that's obviously that doesn't correspond strictly to proteins. We're going to need some sort of barriers to create the stability of things. Because the barrier is bad when we want to get there. But once you are there, the barrier is good because it helps us not to destroy the protein. So there will be some sort of barrier for a real protein structure. Otherwise, they would not have the stability we know. So the question is, where does that come from? And I think I already drew some of these states, right? That there will be some sort of complicated free energy landscape here with barriers and valley. We need to get to that lowest level state. And the question is, how do we get across those barriers? And those barriers don't primarily come from the hydrophobicity or anything, but it comes from the side chain packing. So what happens when the second transition we spoke about here, when we move from the molten globular, so this kind of looked like a protein, but it didn't have the magic yet. The magic is when all the side chains start to find the right position. So think about like, well, grabbing your fingers into something when everything just fits into place and it's perfectly packed. The positively charged residue finds a negatively charged partner. There are no holes or anything. You don't have a, the hydrophobic residue finds another hydrophobic partner and it's well defined, it's unique. 
like all the protein structure we see from the protein data bank and everything. Now, this is not perfect. It's not like proteins have slightly lower density than water, but it's like 80% of the volume here is going to be filled. It's much more like a solid than a liquid in here. It's not like the amino acids will unfold and unfold and move. They will find the right states and then will pretty much stay in that state. You might have some metal groups rotating and everything, but the side chain packing is unique for a protein. That is the magic. Here, on the other hand, in the molten globular, the side chains will move around a bit and they might change place. They can do that because the molten globular is also a bit swollen, right? There is a bit of water in the molten globular. But what's happened here in the way we've pushed out all that water, almost all the water at least, and the side chains have suddenly found all their partners. But the, that leads to a couple of things. If you, if you just look at these states, that there is some sort of native protein state, there is a barrier, and here we call it denatured, which is a bit unfortunate. But think of this as a molten globular state or something. If you start from the native protein and add heat, or something, let's, well, let's say that we add heat, that's good. Initially, that's always bad. And the reason why it's bad is that you have this beautiful packing and now you're tearing your side chains apart. Again, the, the protein, we are at a beautiful stable thing and you're starting to push this uphill. Water can't enter and that's the reason when you're initially pulling this apart, I'm, I'm almost creating a vacuum on the inside, right? And you're taking this beautiful protein and then you're just destroying interactions. I'm not gaining anything. But what eventually happens is that the side chains, they will literally be torn apart. And the side chains will find new hydrogen bonding partners. Water is going to fill the volume inside the protein. And what then happens is that you literally cross the barrier and then you find another state here. Which in general is going to be slightly higher in free energy than your native one. But it's better than the barrier. And again, I'm going to argue that this is very much the molten globular. But based on what you know now, we can start to say what the different processes here are responsible for. So what is entropy and what is energy here of what I just said? Well, you're not quite wrong, but you're not quite right either. So I don't expect you to know this, but the point is that there is something I didn't give you. So the reason we're thinking about this, right, is this equation. This equation that looked so simple and innocent and early on, and that determines everything. And that's going to determine things here too. The point is it's going to depend on the direction we're going. So I hinted about this earlier on the course. When it comes to two types of processes, if a process is limited by energy, then the speed by which it's regulated with just has to whether whether we're adding or removing heat. Where the processes where the limiting barrier is entropy, that's much more searching that you have to wait until you find the right thing. This is hand waving. I'm going to show you with the equations in a few slides. So what I'm going to argue is that if this is again the density, and, and, they, and again, so that left side here of this plot would correspond to something where it's largely unspecific, uh, maybe molten globular or something. In the extreme case, it would be a completely stretched out chain. And the right hand side here would correspond to that the entire molecule is very dense. And I would argue that in general energy starts out high and then we go down because as molecules get closer to each other they will interact more and eventually you're going to start go up. Why, do you, will you go, why will you go up in the end there? Exactly, you will bump into things. So that at some point there is going to be a point where the energy is fairly low here. But this does not create a protein. If you look at entropy on the other hand, entropy starts out high, which is good. And then you're going to drop at some point. I'm going to argue that this happens over a fairly narrow regime because that's really when you start to fall up. 
and then entropy will go down, go down, go down, and at some point you're almost perfectly packed. Maybe it will even start to go down quicker at the end or not. Uh, but do you agree with those rough shape of the curves? Is that the end? So the only point is that, oh, that's a good question. Um, let's see a good analogy here. If you come into a room with lots of people in it, actually the classroom is a good example. So when you need to find a place to sit here in the morning, you just grab a chair, right? It doesn't matter that much if there are already some students in the room. There are free chairs. Until you get to the point where there are only two or three free chairs. Then you have to start a lot. Then you might have to squeeze in behind somebody. So that normally, while well, you are here, we're still fairly stretched out, right? So there is not really a whole lot of things that's limiting the motion of the chain. Yes, we will go down a little bit because occasionally I will bump into another chain. But there isn't really anything that's limiting me a whole lot. But at some point here, when we start to get relatively high densities, suddenly I start to bump into things. And I start to bump into them fairly frequently. And then my entropy will go down fairly quickly. So this is the point where we would actually have to start to find a chair in the classroom. And then you could argue exactly how sharp this is. But my only argument here, there, there is going to be at some point where we lose most of the entropy when we're getting to the point where the protein is starting to be packed. And here we are so low in entropy that we have very little freedom and that we can't really move a whole lot. And what would eventually happen here would probably be where individual atoms stop moving or so. Forget about that last part, not important. If you agree with those two curves, then we just apply E equals F equals E minus TS. So we take the E minus that curve. So we need to turn that around. And if you then add, take that first curve minus the second one, you're going to end up with something that looks like that by definition. Now, exactly how high the state is and the barrier and the second state is, that will depend on the details of the curves. But because of these shapes and because energy goes down and because the entropy drops over a relatively narrow range, you will end up with a barrier based on the packing. So the question is, this barrier is going to explain a whole lot of things about protein folding. But we don't really know what type of barrier it is yet. Or actually, if this was true, because you could, certainly, you could certainly argue that I was wrong. You don't buy the argument that the entropy drops over a narrow regime. You would like some experimental proof for that. We can give you that proof later. But if this is true, let's say that I'm started out here and I want to fold my protein. Uh, or actually, no, let's, it's, let's do the easier alternative first. I start out here in the end state. I am a protein. And then I want to get over this barrier from the right side to the left side. What is it what I'm paying in when I want to go from the, from the native state to the denatured state? Look at those two curves. What type of barrier is it? Energy. It's energy, right? Because I'm paying energy. The entropy is not really a whole lot of... Eventually, I'm going to gain entropy, but initially, I pay in energy. So when we unfold the protein, you pay in energy. If you are in the denatured state and try to fold the protein, on the other hand, what type of barrier is that? Again, if these curves are right. Entropy. So you need to somehow, you need to search to find the packing. So you need to test all these different, it's, it's unlikely that you would find them randomly, and you need to test all of them until you find the one that's really good. And that's part of the reason why protein folding is fairly slow. It's a searching process. So the cool thing here is that Despite this equation that looked so seemingly innocent in the beginning, it's super complicated. You can have a barrier that has different character depending on the way we take over it. We'll come back to that. Uh, um, let's see. Yes, uh, I'll, I'll take five, ten more minutes. Then it's going to be a good break point. You might not buy that for now, which is perfectly fine. I'm going to show you some equations after the break where we can actually derive this from experiments, that this type of barriers are true. But we spent a little time talking about the denatured state. We talked about the molten state. So let's have a look at the final native state one. So the native state, I would argue, is that it's unique. It's unique in two ways. We have the biological function there. That's how we can measure and test that it's unique. 
and structure-wise, it's a very close packed state. It also has very low energy. It has both low energy and low free energy. The low energy comes from, sorry, the low free energy is mainly caused by the low energy. The entropy here is lousy. Lousy in the sense that it's low. There's only one, if it's unique, we hate that entropy wise. We lost all that beautiful freedom. So the only reason we want to be there is that you must have some very nicely packed state where you have really good energy. Now, of course, to find that state from where we start, we might need to get over lots of entropy barriers, but we will only be stable in that state at the end if it has low energy. And you can, this is one of the things what I love with simulations, this is right, we know that. From all the predictions we do in bioinformatics and everything, those native states really correspond to when we have all the hydrogen bonds in place. Computers have solved that for us. It's no longer an hypothesis, we know that it's true. So although we can certainly talk about free energy and everything, but somewhere here in the end game, when we determine why do you get here, we should somehow look at energy levels almost corresponding to these very simple labs you did early on in the course. But then I also said that not all proteins are going to form stable, sorry, not all sequences are going to form stable proteins. So maybe we should look at those energy levels. Um, if, well, we already had the energy, the entropy, and the free energy. And then we can do the things that we did a couple of times before when we looked at it. You can plot how much entropy, that is how much freedom do we have as we are changing the energy. Why did we use those type of plots? So that, that was this type of plot that was very, I was about to say uncomfortable. Oh yes, they are uncomfortable too. They're not obvious. Um, I don't have a gut feeling for entropy relative to energy means, but it's these plots that determine what regions are stable, right? When do phase transitions happen? The slope here had to do with this one over the temperature part. So that being up somewhere here was good, being down there was, uh, sorry, um, being up there was bad, being down there was good. But we also know now that what determines if something is a stable fold? It's going to be low energy. So somehow we need to get to the left part of these diagrams. Otherwise, we don't have a low energy. And there's going to be some sort of curve here that could vary any possible way. But if we want to get to the left part of this, that also means that in general, the entropy will go down. So going down in energy is good. Going down in entropy is bad. And then you can imagine a couple of different things that can happen. One of them is that you have a beautiful, nice curve that gradually goes down here. And eventually you're going to get, reach some sort of point here where you have the slope corresponds to one over the temperature, and then we're going to be stable. That happens for lots of molecules, but not proteins. So what this corresponds, you basically freeze in, almost like freezing water. No, no actually water is not even a good example. Um, Freezing a polymer is a great thing. Oh, wait, it says heteropolymer there. Uh, or a random chain of amino acids. If you just take 100 amino acids and synthesize them in a chain, and you have them in a test tube and you're happy, it's 100 degrees centigrade, and then you gradually drop the temperature. They might find some sort of random collapsed state, but there is no magic. It's just a molten globular. Yes, all the hydrophobic parts will be turned to the inside and the hydrophilic parts to the outside, but it's not going to do anything. It's not particularly well defined. What also means that if you're adding epsilon heat, if I'm heating your protein by one degree centigrade, it's going to move up to a slightly higher energy. You will have moved one torsion of the chain or something. So yes, it will move a bit, and you could probably determine some sort of average contents of the alpha helices and sheets, but there is no magic, no protein. But in a few other cases, you will still go down here, but there are some very low energy states that you almost need to take a jump in energy down. And that would correspond to this. What if there is, for your polypeptide, there is a one state where all the hydrogen bonds are paired up into a beautiful beta sheet or alpha helix or something. So you have lots of favorable interactions. Now, of course, that's going to be, well, if you take your two strands of your beta sheets and tear them apart, you just lost four hydrogen bonds or more, uh, maybe 14. So that's, you're going to take a fairly large jump in energy, right? And for now, I'm not saying which one of this is true, but you could probably imagine that you could have both of those states. What's going to happen in 
in the first state that I showed you on the right. That's a fairly boring continuous thing. But what will happen here, as the temperature goes down, under some conditions you can jump to that lowest energy state. And if we jump there, we're going to be stable. Then we don't want to move away from that. But the problem is that it's important that we don't get stuck here. But if you first get stuck, like the one on the right one, you're never going to be able to find the state. So what we need here is that the distribution of all these states is going to be determined by the Boltzmann distribution. And even if there are some barriers to get across between these states, as you're dropping the temperature here, the temperature becomes lower and lower and lower. And then we favor the lower lying energy states. But there will also be barriers between these states, right? Uh, but what if the barrier is so high here so that as your temperature goes down, you should favor the lower states. But as the temperature goes down, you will not be able to cross barriers either. So that your barriers need to be so low that you can cross them. But this state has to be so low that it's significantly more stable than the others. So this is going to be a balance between how high the barriers are, whether how low this energy is. You would like a very well-defined low energy state that doesn't really have a gigantic barrier to it. These energy gaps is pretty much what explain folding. Uh, very few random structures have low energy. Or they have low energy, but they don't have this super low ra I like the word magic. <laughs> Because that you have this amazing, beautiful paired up secondary structure. That's what creates the pairing of all those hydrogen bonds. And that's what in turn gives you the perfect packing with the Lena Jones and everything. You push out the water and then you, then you make this gigantic drop in energy. Now, the stabilization and free energy will still be fairly low. Because while we get the gain in energy, we will pay for that in blood or entropy. So that we need to have a sort of well-defined lowest energy structure that's clearly separate from the others. That's going to be the reason why this is stable. And if this gap between the lowest and the second lowest one is much larger than KT, well, there should be some sort of barrier here. It's hard to get over that gap because this is literally a gap. There has to be a gap in the energy. On the other end, if the gap is much smaller than KT, we will be able to gradually move over it just by KT, and that's bad, because then it's not going to be well defined. So remember what I said, when you want to get there, the gap is bad. Once you are there, the gap is what saves you. So you somehow need to be able to get over the gap. The gap can't be too large, then you can't get there, but it can't be too low, then we will slide out of it when we're there. Is the gap the barrier? Yes, literally, that's literally the energy barrier. Uh, but of course, in terms of, free en uh, in terms of free energy, the other part we have to find it too, right? So there's also an entropy part to it. The reason why you get this for proteins is the packing. And it's not just random packing of hydrophobic amino acids. What determines the packing in proteins? And whether the packing is good. The side chains, and not just the side chains, the specific side chains, right? It's going to be super important to have, a, say, a tryptophan in this specific position. And it's going to be super important to have an arginine in this other position. You can't just randomly replace them. And this is the homopolymer part. Proteins are not just a general polymer. They are heteropolymers. And this is the reason why I brought up this strange thing about the density and the polymer part. Proteins need to be polymers, because if they were not polymers, it would never be favorable to have these compact states. On the other hand, the compact state doesn't give you anything more than a random, fairly compact structure. To get from this structure to have a transition where you have something that's highly specific, you need heteropolymers that are very, very specific, different amino acids, and it's important to have the right one in the right place. That's something that you don't have in plastic, but we do have it in a protein. So the point is that protein, you can't create a protein just, if you just randomly created a sequence of amino acids, that's effectively the same thing as a bit of plastic. You're not going to get a protein by randomly thinking, because you're not going to get the specificity by randomly assembling amino acids. And this is the problem, because if you're not going to create a protein with 100 residues, divine is, well, if you can do it with divine inspiration, more power to you. But the problem is one and 100 amino acids is still a tiny protein, right? 
it's going to be super hard to design a protein and somehow get this magic. And that's why we use computers, bioinformatics, to somehow can we try to identify what the uniqueness is so that we get the really beautiful packing. And one great way of doing this was cheating and see what nature has done. Uh, you're not allowed to cheat on the test, but in the work, you're allowed to cheat by looking at what nature has done. Actually, looking at what nature has done is okay in the test too. Um, and that's why random polypeptides will not form proteins. And you can calculate, you can guess what the probabilities are gonna be if you talk about 100 amino acids and there are 20, 20 to the power of 100, that ballpark. I will show you one more slide and then it's time for break. Um, Remember that we spoke about fold stability, right? And that I introduced, you could think of that, it's not really a temperature, but could you think of that denominator as a sort of characteristic temperature of the transition? Remember that for yesterday? That slope in these diagrams also corresponds at some sort of one over temperature thing. And it's gonna turn, these characteristic temperatures, they really, it's gonna correspond at the temperature at which we have the protein folding happening. So that if you're running this as a temperature that's significantly higher than what that slope would correspond to, you can easily get to the gap here, but you will also get, be able to get away from it. When the temperature is significantly lower, you're not really gonna be able to get to the gap. So that these temperatures that might be in the ballpark of 350 Kelvin or something is very much going to correspond to the protein folding temperatures. And for a specific, if you know the specific chain and if you know the free energy of the entire chain, we could in theory calculate this. Theory is the key word here. Because the problem for a real protein, you would have at least 10,000 atoms or something, well, 1,000 atoms. 3,000 degrees of freedom. It's an insanely large landscape. So that we, can't, we can't calculate anything like this for a real protein. If you didn't do it yet, you are going to do that in one of the labs. And we, we frequent, to understand this, it's great to work with a toy model. And that's why we like to work with the simple energy things. You're going to work with beads on a string or something. Because these systems are so simple that we can try to enumerate all these energy levels to capture the ideas here. But for any real protein, you can't do this. You can't even do it in an MD simulation. Well, maybe in an MD simulation for a small protein. But... So we use this to understand the concepts, but this is not the way you could design proteins in general. But what we do know is that the folding process in general has to do with the transition between some sort of molten globular and the native state. Vitrification in general, all type of random polymers will move down, but they might get stuck. They will simply stop moving. While the ones that form proteins, they form proteins because they under the right conditions, they can jump to this lowest energy state. And it's well defined, and then we will stay there. Um, let's skip this about the vitrification temperatures because it's not that important. If you want to uh, go into details, uh, the book spends quite a bit of time on it. It's 10.30 now. Uh, I would suggest we reconvene here at 11 a.m. And uh, then we're going to speak about fold uniqueness a little bit more about the kinetics, and I will come back and show you why those entropy versus energy barriers really are what they are. I think I changed my mind just so slightly here. I will tell you about this melting versus vitrification temperatures, partly because it couples back to some things we covered earlier on in the course. Remember when I first introduced these strange entropy as a function of energy diagrams? We did that in the context of understanding continuous gradual transitions versus phase transitions. And if I, I drew curves like this, right? We have energy here and S here, where it said that the slope here corresponds to one over the temperature. And at any point along this curve, I had an energy and an entropy. So if I'm above this curve, up in the top left here, I can be at the same energy, but with higher entropy. That would be good. Or I could be at the same entropy, but with lower energy. That would also be good. So that this is the good part, and this is the bad part. Let me say lower F and higher F. Now, of course, I can't just move up here because I need to stay on the curve. But in theory, it would be better if I could be up here. Uh, the concept of the gradual phase transition is that at any point along this curve would be stable. And what determines, well, I was about to say what determines where I am. It doesn't really determine what I am. But 
at any given point in this curve, there is a well-defined slope on the curve. And that slope defines the temperature. So the temperature really has to do with, the temperature is a function of entropy and energy rather than what causes it. And it's boring, so this corresponds to heating water. Any point here I'm stable and happy at. And if it dropped the energy, I would move, sorry, well, at a specific temperature here, there's going to be one unique defined point. But then I also said that there were these other regions, if things looked like that, right? That would mean that if I'm now at this point, that would be like balancing at the edge of a knife. That is the worst possible free energy I could have along that curve. So here was the opposite. Here was the best free energy I could have along that curve, the point that's closest to the good part. Here I am at the point that's closest to the bad part. So this would be like balancing on the edge of a knife that you don't want to do typically. And in general, this would mean that if you look at over broader distributions of temperature or something, you would have some sort of regions like, the, like that, and then maybe a region that looked like that, and then a region that like looked like that. And what I then argued is that if we then draw some sort of limit here, that would mean that here I would be gradually heating the ice, and I would gradually heat the ice, I would gradually heat the ice, and then I'm going to get to this no man's land here. I so don't want to be here. And what that would mean that I would effectively jump here is that, and then I would be gradually be heating water. So this corresponds, these regions of depressions corresponded to phase transitions, right? Let's have a look here, what we have. So you could have a transition that it's gradual, gradual, gradual. This corresponds just to heating or cooling water. And at some point, we're going to get to a point here that we're stuck at the fairly high derivative, which is the lowest temperature. But we might also have a shape of this landscape that instead of seeing that this is sharp, do you see that the dashed line here, right? You could imagine instead of getting stuck here, we could make a jump from that point all the way down to that point. And I get a great question as a break. Wouldn't that correspond to zero derivative, which would be infinite temperature? Well, yes, in this simple model, it probably would. But you could imagine if this, if this somehow continued down in a very weak way here. It's a model. So you might be able to jump from that point to the upper point here and completely skip the strange part of that if we can do that as a temperature that's sufficiently high. So what determines this slope is going to be the temperature of the move. And we already spoke about when proteins melt and everything, right? That it depends on how much energy we need to, uh, to add here. So if the melting or folding temperature of a protein is higher than the temperature that we would get stuck, then we are able to make this jump and form a real phase transition into a well unique fold design. But if this is a fairly low temperature, if I would only be able to get that until say minus 50 degrees centigrade, what would first happen is that I would get stuck here and things would stop moving. And because things have stopped moving, I no longer have enough energy to actually make the jump to the well-defined state. So yes, there could in theory be something better, but I can't really make the jump there anymore. So that it actually does correspond very closely to phase transitions. Well, of course, this is a very simple model and for a real protein, it's not that the folded state would be a single entropy state. You can still have motions of bonds, torsions can move a little bit so that this is highly simplified. But this is what has it, the vitrification temperature would be in the temperature where we'd stop moving and it's important that we can fold or melt at a temperature that's above that. So that's going to depend exactly what these temperatures are and everything, what's going to determine that? What determines those properties? The side chains, the specificity, the packing. So what we said yesterday and repeated this morning is that sequences that fold into stable proteins, they do so because their native state is unique, well-defined, they're good, and they have a unique structure that is able to accommodate lots of these sequences. And what we showed in the previous slides here is that this uniqueness corresponds to having a well-defined energy gap. It's exactly the same thing. If there was not a clear energy gap, you wouldn't be that unique. Then you could gradually move away. And the whole point, if you can do it gradually, there are going to be lots of states just like it, and then you're not really unique anymore. 
So the uniqueness corresponds to the gap that you're different. And the way that determines this is very much natural selection. If you were not unique, you would not have a very stable protein and you could easily get over the barrier. And as good as the barrier is, sorry, as bad as the barrier is when we want to fold, the second you are folded, the barrier is what helps us stay folded. And we can actually hand wave about this now with the Boltzmann distribution. Because what, I, what I've been telling you a bunch of times is that it's going to be very rare that you have this uniqueness. But already yesterday we spoke, well, we can talk about this in terms of this some sort of vitrification temperature. And that's the temperature we got from the cost of these defects, right? A few kilocalories. So that the likelihood of having one such energy state that is significantly lower than the other ones, that's going to correspond to having that delta E and comparing that to the vitrification temperature. And if we want something that the energy gap should be something like 20 times low, lower than the vitrification temperature, so high that we're not going to get over it by mistake, that's going to correspond to a probability to maybe one in a million or a billion or so. The exact number doesn't matter, but it's, it's a fairly small number. So the likelihood if you randomly create a protein that will, sorry, if you randomly create a sequence of amino acids, the likelihood that it's going to have one unique state that's significantly better than the others. And again, you can say 10x there, that's not important. But it's going to be a very, very low probability. Yes? Sorry, can you define vitrification? So vit yeah, vitrification, um, ha, you're going to see it. Vitrification really just means that you stop moving. So you freeze in, but you're freezing gradually. So you can think of, I'm not sure, with slime or something. It's not really a phase temperature. Uh, I'm going to show you that in cryo-EM later on, but uh, for now on, think of it as that you're some sort of glass-like state and that you just stop moving. But it's not like you make a phase transition. I think of water molecules that just stop moving instead of making a transition to ice. Um, and the only reason I would not introduce the concept if it wasn't for the fact that the books loves to use it. So the and whether this is, of course, not exactly 10 to the minus 8. It might be 10 to the minus 6, or it might be 10 to the minus 9. But it's a very low number. And unless you feel really lucky, remember it's Friday the 13th today, unless you feel really lucky, don't try to go in the lab and hope to strike that jackpot. Because you're not. You're going you're gonna to waste your entire PhD testing things. You cannot, none of us can form, without massive help of computers, you can't form a random protein. Sorry, you can't form a random se a sequence that will fold into a protein without massive amounts of help. And this also starts to hint to the point, why are proteins unique? Do proteins have to be unique? Couldn't you imagine having two such states? So what would the probability be of having two such states? Yeah, but how much lower? Uh, 10 to the power 16, maybe 16. Roughly, right? Because if they're independent probabilities, the probability of one state having that energy is that low. The probability of having another state that has that low energy is roughly the same. And if they are independent, we should just multiply the probabilities. So maybe 10 to the minus 16. If there are three <coughs> such states, 10 to the minus 24. We're starting to be fairly low now, right? So it's, and here's the thing, it's not forbidden. You can have such states. But it's going to be exceptionally rare probability. It's already rare that you can form a stable protein. The likelihood that you would have a molecule with two states is so astronomically low that you can almost forget about it. Almost. So there are these exceptionally rare examples that we spoke about with proteins where the native state is not necessarily the lowest free energy state. And here is, these are so few, so we can't even calculate these probabilities correctly. These are just orders of magnitude examples. But given this, and given the number of sequences we have, and again, I might be off by five orders of magnitude here, but there are lots of proteins in the world, and there might be one protein in 100,000 or a million or something that can have a second state that's stable. And again, with rough order, hand-waving, order of magnitude estimates, that seem to hold. Most proteins only have one state, and there are a handful of them that might have two. And unfortunately, that usually causes problems. So what these correspond to is just that you happen to have two 
they're not stable, but they have two low energy states where the structure is stable, but only one of them is going to be native. Having said that, um, I'm going to spend a few slides talking a little bit about how protein folding happens in vivo, because that's something that the book doesn't bring up. And it's something I want you to know about for the rest of your careers and everything. I'm going to come back a little bit to the kinetics, but if I figured that you'd have enough equations that I should mix in something that's not equations today. So the danger here, here I've only talked about the physics and we've not considered the processes at all. Where do proteins come from in your body? Well, the amino acids come from stuff you eat, but where does the genetic information come from? It's not a trick question. <laughs> DNA, good. Uh, I was a bit worried there for a second. This information is first read by an enzyme called DNA polymerase. Uh, why is it an enzyme? What was the definition of an enzyme? So it catalyzes it. In theory, because this is one state, and you could imagine the copy, if you made copies of DNA, that's also a stable state. Exactly how it happens, again, the free end, you can't depend on the path we take. But what this does is that it helps it happen faster, because otherwise it would take forever. Uh, but DNA can make sure that it happens faster than we uh, think. Um, it's pretty darn good at not making errors. Well, it happens now and then, like once in a billion or so. So what this one does, it helps untie DNA and it helps break the base pair so that you can then form two stable molecules of DNA. The, oh, sorry, not DNA. Um, the replication here, can you use that for something? We need to use that in a couple of cases. So there's a very special Nobel Prize related to this. Um, if you want to sequence things, or if you want to copy or express DNA, you need to create more copies of DNA. The only problem is that your body, sorry to say, but your bodies are not that good at doing it. We don't, how frequently do you need to copy DNA in your bodies when we divide cells, right? And then we need to have one copy per cell. So these enzymes, they don't need to be that efficient. So if you would like this, but it would be great if you could somehow use these enzymes and have lots of them or something to speed up the process. That would be great because then you can make the process happen faster. So can, if you, there is a chemistry process and you would like the process to happen faster, what could you do typically? Raise the temperature. It's a great idea. What's going to happen? It's a protein. What's going to happen when you raise the temperature? You denature the protein. Too bad. It's not going to work. You can raise the temperature maybe 5 degrees or something, or 10 degrees, and at some point you're going to start to unfold the entire protein. That's bad. And for a long time, that's where we were. We couldn't replicate DNA very efficiently. Can you think of any? So what you really would like, you would like this enzyme, and you would like to be able to run the process at much higher temperature, right? Could you come up with any way to do that? So remember yesterday that I said it was not the completely crazy things to do this with uh, cold shock proteins. There are other organisms that don't live under very cold conditions, but there are organisms that live under very hot conditions. In particular, organisms that say live in geysers or so. They need, their machinery has to work at 70, 80 degrees centigrade. So let's go to one of those organisms and steal their DNA polymerase. And there's this particular organism called Thermophilus aquaticus that you might heard about. TAC. Sorry? It's PCR, which Carrie Mollis and you have it in lecture has got the Nobel Prize for. It's a super simple discovery. We stole an enzyme from a heat proof bacterium. And then you can heat cycle it and create more copies. And that's what we do. This used to be a super advanced techniques, and now you do it in every single lab. It's high life lab, and there you have PCR machines. And that's what we use to replicate DNA. It's as simple as that. But the fundamental process, you needed a protein that was thermostable. And it was actually discovered in Yellowstone. He didn't discover it, he just stole the protein. But so stealing is good. 
uh, you're gonna need that just gives you DNA so you're gonna need to read this recipe too so there's another gigantic molecule uh, discovered by Rog Kornberg from uh, Structural Biology at Stanford that I, I work together with Mike Levitt in his lab here you have the DNA that is bound to a gigantic machinery here which is another polymerase which is also an enzyme that takes the DNA information and copies this into RNA, messenger RNA even. And Roger spent the good part, a few decades, trying to determine the structure of these molecules. The second you have this information in RNA instead, it's being fed into the ribosome. The ribosome is the third Nobel Prize in these slides. Uh, and then the ribosome is a gigantic machine. There's roughly, 50, I think it's 58 protein chains. And there's a ton of RNA bound in it too. And then you have the messenger RNA come in here and paired up with transfer RNA that carries the small amino acids building blocks, right? And then you polymerize the chain so that you create, you stitch the peptide bonds together. And then effectively you have the protein, at the end you have the, pro, the nascent chain coming out of this protein exit tunnel. And in practice, this folding takes a few seconds to minutes. You're gradually moving through the chain and this and creating more protein. And today, we have, there, are, there are a ton of these structures determined now. But it's less than 10, well, no, it's not 10, it's 15 years ago. So that today, virtually everybody in this field has switched to cryo-electron microscopy. But the first structure is just a bit over 15 years old. But can you imagine the work of determining a structure with 100,000 atoms in it? and understanding where every single chain and everything is. The reason we know is that we can actually test the synthesis quite well. Um, there are some proteins like luciferase, for instance, that when the protein is folded, it will emit light. And if we then start the synthesis process here, there is no light, there is no light, there is no light, there is no light, and then after a quarter of an hour or something, you're going to start to see the light increasing. And by that way, we know it took roughly 15 minutes for the first protein to be completely synthesized and folded. So in general, the slowest process here is usually how quickly we can build the basis and add to it. The protein folding is usually, but not always, but usually faster than, uh, than the whole uh, translation and, uh, in the ribosome. And the way we know that is that I let this process continue, I let this process continue, I let this process continue, and then I use a way to just stop adding more residues, and then boom, it stops instantly. Because when I'm no longer feeding in more residues through the ribosome, I instantly won't get any more protein. So the folding is much, much faster than creating the chain in the machinery, at least for small proteins. We also know that and what this means is that folding, at least for, for, for small proteins, is what you call co-translational. So that as you are translating it, the protein is folding right away. Because the folding process is faster than the translation process. Which should make us happy, because that's kind of what Amfinsen said, right? If you just create the chain, whether it's a ribosome, we don't really care. But the chain itself will fold. It's not that we have to produce it in a specific order or something. Um, the... Uh, bad part of this is that it's not really true. Uh, there are lots of enzymes that improve folding rates and everything. And there are even some large proteins that won't fold unless you have very special conditions. So when I was about your age, there were some new results of we had started to discover the first molecules that actually help other proteins fold. And at the point we had very little idea about what they actually did. So, and it, it turns out that in particular one problem is that you have some of these large proteins with lots of hydrophobic molecules in it. They will just stick together in a hydrophobic glue in the ways they should not stick together. Because you might have want to form some beautiful beta sheets, but we haven't formed the entire protein, right? Remember what I said, that folding is frequently faster than the production of the amino acids? So what if I now had a beta sheet that the N terminus should go there, and then there should be some sort of long chain going out here, forming another domain. And then I should continue the beta sheet there, right? You could imagine that. The only problem is that once I've folded, once I've, sorry, once I've produced, translated the first three sheets here, what if there is some hydrophobic part in this long sequence that shouldn't be longer? Yes, it would be better to have the fourth strand there, but the fourth strand has not yet been produced. And unfortunately, I might have a strand down here that would now bind there by mistake. It's not better, 
but I don't have that strand yet. So while I am folding the protein, it would be better to bind that one. And now you've already formed an incorrect beta sheet. And it would be a very high free energy barrier to start breaking that up. That's a bummer. So you're now going to get the protein collapsing into something before you folded it. And you're going to be paying a lot to unfold it. So it turns out that there are proteins that can help this. Uh, amazingly beautiful molecules, chaperones or chaperonins. So these are lo very large molecules that effectively have a hydrophobic interior. And you see that they consist of a ton of different subunits. The most famous one is GROW-EL and GROW-ES. So it's a molecule that contains of two parts so that you effectively have almost have a hydrophobic lid to it. And these molecules can use ATP to go through a cycle where it opens up. It binds these large hydrophobic aggregates. But because this protein is now hydrophobic on the inside, you have a large hydrophobic uh, cavity here. Here, it's hydrophobic all over, so you can allow these proteins to unfold and expose it to other hydrophobic parts. And as you now have the entire protein, the protein can now slowly inside here find the right fourth beta sheet and fold correctly again. So this creates environment that, I, in fact, it does unfold the protein, and that's why we need the ATP. But it creates an environment like kindergarten or whatever you call it that the protein can gradually find its right shape and then it will release it again. So why doesn't nature use this for all proteins? Then you have figured that could be a great idea, right? You could have much more, much larger, much more complicated folds and everything. Seems like a great idea. So this, is, uh, this will, of course, vary from protein to protein, right? Uh, what this protein mostly does, remember that what I said here, the problem is that you're going to have proteins where there is a very large barrier. And unfortunately, we fall down on the wrong side of that barrier. We end up with something where we don't want to be because it happens while we're folding it. What this creates an environment where I try to take away a bit of that barrier. And I take, probably take away that by making this uh, folded state slightly less favorable. Uh, so what I'm doing, I'm pretty much creating an environment where I make it a bit easier for you to search around again. But of course, that will likely mean I will also have destabilized the, uh, the finite folded state a bit. But I make it, if I didn't do that, I would forever be stuck in a horrible non-working state. But why don't we use this for all proteins? Yes, it says there, it says ATP. ATP is, well, it's good in a way, but it's bad. We don't want to spend it, right? So if you had to spend ATP to fix up colorectal protein, that would be horrible. We would need even, even more energy. So why do we have this in the first place? So there could, of course, be cases where you need to create large proteins, right? In particular, in higher organisms, the more advanced the organism is, you need to create even more advanced large protein structures. And there are simply structures that we can't create them with tiny building blocks with four to six alpha helices. And if you don't have any choice, again, depending on the organism, the functionality might be so important that it's in a few cases, it is worth to spend ATP energy in order to be able to create protein structures that we otherwise could not do. But this is going to be a balance that is determined by natural selection. It's less rare, it's, it's much less common in bacteria. Because in bacteria, you want simple structures so you can, because what you're going to be paying here, the folding rate is going to be much lower if you need to involve chaperonins, right? And bacteria need to be optimized for speed. <coughs> yes? Uh, how would you argue for that? I wouldn't so much argue, I would say that it's an observation mainly. We, why? Uh, well, we don't know that. We are slightly more complicated than bacteria, right? We have, uh, we have a vertebrae and uh, it's more of an observation uh, rather than an argument. Obviously, we have more advanced functions. There are lots of functions in humans that you don't have in bacteria. Why we have them? It's a good question.
Oh, sure. No, but there's no question that is better for this. But the question is why? Um, why are we not bacteria? So that comes back to we like to see ourselves as the pinnacle of evolution. I'm not quite sure whether it's true. In many ways, as I said, bacteria are probably more efficient. So it might be that give it a few billion years and we're going to die out and the world will be ruled by bacteria. <laughs> um, and this, you might not think that, it, but it connects back to where, the, where we all started. Leventhal's paradox. So you know Leventhal's paradox by now. That, and the argument is that it's, this search problem here is so insane that it would take forever. But when I introduced that with said search problem, what would you say now? It is a word. <coughs> what type of barrier did we have to folding? Entropy. So what Leventhal's paradox really <coughs> describes is the entropic searching, right? How do you get over the entropy barrier when we're folding things? <coughs> and there are a few ways uh, so that all we need to do is that we need to find a way to make the search process more efficient. And there was actually a very uh, great suggestion by Phillips that what if folding just starts around the end terminus of the chain? That would work awesome <coughs> together with the chain gradually being produced. It's a fantastic model. It's a beautiful model. It solves Leventhal's paradox, and there's only one problem is that it's not true, which we can test experimentally. Uh, it doesn't work. You can remove the end terminus of most proteins, and they will still fold. Too bad. And that means that we need to throw it out. But what Leventhal is effectively saying is that it's not just a matter of finding this lowest minimum of free energy, but proteins are effectively under kinetic control. And I'll spend a minute on that. that so what it means is that it doesn't matter if that in theory there could be an even better free energy state. If you can't find that in, if it would take a year for you to find that, it's completely irrelevant because we're never going to find it in the first place. So forget about that lowest free energy in the free energy landscape. All that matters are what are the states that are accessible in finite time. If you can't find it within a few minutes, forget about it. Which in one, it's huge because now we're throwing out almost all of thermodynamics. We're going to get it back in in a second. But it's all about the barriers. What can you find and how can we get over these free energy barriers? If you can't get over it, it has nothing to do with, free, with uh, protein folding. So that the argument that came up quite soon is there has to be some sort of pathways. Imagine this as some sort of path through the forest here or something. There has to be a guide. The protein will have to implicitly be pushed in the right direction. There is no way we can try everything. Now, how it is pushed in the right direction will, of course, depend on the landscape. And that's where the total free energy comes in. It's not completely independent. And what we can then do is that what people did fairly early is say, can you come up with different models where as this chain is being collapsed, how should the chain be guided? It's not a completely random search. And there are three traditional models that are used and all of them, all of them have a bit of truth. I would argue that one of them is significantly better than the others, but here too you could argue that there are points to each of them. So the first one is the oldest, which is diffusion collision. And it's hierarchical and Let's start with the model first. That if you have this long chain, the argument is that we would very quickly form the secondary structure, in particular the helices. And we've already seen in some simulations that helices can form very quick. And the second you form this helix, instead of having 25 amino acids here that are all independent, you now just have one element, one big helix diffusing around. And then you have another 25 residues here, but that's also now just one helix. So suddenly we just have two helices instead of 50 residues. That's a dramatic reduction of our search space, right? And let's just assume that the beta sheet was equally fast, which we sadly know that it isn't always. But if that beta sheet could form, if we could form those three, four elements, suddenly it's just three, four large building blocks diffusing. And then they need to bump into each other and search a bit. And then we would form a protein. Now that might take a second or so. But we can pay that second. We can't pay a billion years, but we can wait a second. So you somehow call this framework model, but I think diffusion collision really describes that, that random secondary, well, not random, but secondary structure elements that diffuse around and collide with each other. And when they find the good states, they bind. And this could definitely explain how helices and, uh, sorry, it could definitely explain the protein folding. It would definitely explain how we get over Leventhal's paradox. The only thing that we're not sure, of course, is whether it's true or not. 
For if, if you have lots of small alpha helices, it might very well be true. Beta sheets, more questionable. But there are proteins where it will work. You could also argue that what really happens is that almost what I drew in the blackboard before, that we have some, everything is focused on the molten globular. That we have this chain that's collapsing into the molten globular, and then we have a complete mess here, but the mess is roughly in the right place, and that this is just as much hand-waving as it sounds. Uh, and then we would gradually have the secondary structure elements formed. This was popular decades ago. The only problem here is that we've, as we've gotten more and more advanced experimental techniques, we've learned more about the molten globular. So even when I was a student, we kind of liked to think of the molten globular that way. Compared to what you saw early on in this lecture, what do you think about this model? The sad point is that there is increasing experimental evidence that that's not what the molten globular looks like. We have the secondary structures already in the molten globular. So sadly, I would say out of the three models, this is likely the worst one. So for whatever reason, it likely doesn't happen this way. But, but the point is, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad model. Because that to solve Leventhal's paradox, I only need to show that there are ways for the proteins to find the native state without going through very high barriers. There might be something that's even better than what I proposed, and then it can happen even faster. But to understand why proteins can fold, it's enough to find one possible way. Then there might be some even better, but I only need to prove that it won't take an infinite amount of time. So this, it's not an entirely stupid model. And the third one, which is the newest, is what you call, this sounds like a bit, a bit complicated, but it's, we're going to come back to it, nucleation condensation. The argument here is that you have this gigantic protein mess chain, whether you call this a molten globular or something, uh, let's skip that for a second. But what happens then is that there are a few very important contacts here that start to form. That whether you call this key residues or VIP residues or something, but some residues are more equal than the others. They will start to form some sort of contact, a core. Think of it as a droplet. Uh, nucleation is something you frequently use in physics when, say, when ice starts to form, the ice will start to form. It's not forming all over the liquid. There is a core somewhere where the ice starts to form, and then you have more molecules condensing on that. So the idea here is that there is some sort of core, a droplet in the middle, that you start to form things, and then you're growing things out and out and out. And the idea, if this was true, we should be able to somehow identify that as a transition state. That might be super expensive, but if we know that that is the state you need to get to, once we are at that state, it will be downhill on the other side. So why don't we just determine that state? And check whether, it's, whether it looks that way or not. What do you know about transition states? It's the highest possible free end you can imagine. There is no way we could determine that. We can't. By definition, you're, you're trying to determine a state that will be balancing on the edge of a knife. So while it's a great model, we determining that, you can't crystallize that state. It's completely impossible. But bear with me. We're going to come back to that, uh, I think, next week. Uh, but the idea here is that this initial models would somehow lock things in. And then it's not a matter of every part of the protein trying to interact with every other part of the protein. The only residues that could bind to these are the ones that are already relatively close in the sequence. So this would very much correspond to what ice gradually forming in water. If, I ha if you haven't understood it by now, this is likely the model that is the best description of real protein folding. The only problem is this far it's only a model, and we have no idea whether it actually serves Leventhal's paradox, uh, sorry, whether it solves Leventhal's paradox or not. Yes? I'm just thinking all of these three models hmm? start off with the, with the chain being just like there. Hmm? Uh, and I'm thinking when, when the peptide chain is coming out of the ribosome, I mean, you can see that the folding doesn't start there, but yeah. isn't it like super low entropy to be to be just a chain like that? Wouldn't it start to interact as soon with, like the residues start to interact with each other as soon as they start coming out? 
You could argue that, uh, so of course, we haven't defined exactly where this is. We also haven't decided exactly where this is happening. So my counter argument here would be, well, maybe this happens not out in water, but this could happen inside the exit tunnel of the ribosome. And for some proteins, that's actually where it happens. Alpha helices in particular tend to form already in the exit tunnel. But the other thing is don't add too much detail, because if you, trust me, there is enough detail in biology that it will last a lifetime, right? And if you start to, if you start to build up too many complications and problems, you will never understand this directly. A good argument is that if you ask the question, is it possible to get from here to the, say, parking lot out there? In theory, there are lots of ways to do this, right? And you could try to determine a measure that map out every single possible path in the house through Stockholm University campus, or I can just walk out that door and exit door. I have found one way. And the argument, the question was, is it possible? And I just showed that it was possible. You might know an even better way, but that doesn't change the argument. All we wanted to show that it was possible. So that at this point, I don't, I don't want to worry too much about the details. We just want to show that there are models where we can solve the searching problem and crack Leventhal's paradox. I'm not saying that this is the best possible case for every single protein. So that this would probably be something like the molten globule, that you started to form a structure and think that this is semi-stable. And so this would be the molten globule. This would be this transition barrier that we need to get across to really fold the protein. And that would be the folded state. So you're actually, uh, you're a, uh, that's actually a good point. Um, I would not say that that's very rapid. Uh, there's, a, there's a long search process. So this will, this will test lots of, different uh, lots of different states. Most of these states are not going to be right. But at some point, when you find the right pair here, it, it's not that it's going to take a long time for the pair to, fall, to form or something. But you will, of course, you will need to, it's going to be lots of trial and error here. So you will constantly go back and forth here until you have found the right transition state. Once we have found the right transition state, you will gradually condense on it. Um, but you're actually quite right. In this case, rapid might, it might not be good to say rapid and slow there. Hmm? Can you find the, these key residues if you mutate them and then the, the folding goes a lot slower? So that's, that's to be a good idea. Uh, it's not entirely easy, right? Because we're just saying that there are two points here. Are these residues important for the transition state? So the one question is, what is the role of the residue here? A second question is, what is the role of the residue here? So the question is, if the residue, if you stabilize, how much do you stabilize or destabilize the transition state versus how much do you stabilize or destabilize the final state? But if you, of course, exactly right, that's where we want to get. But it's, a comp it's not just one state. So I need to try to separate how much do I stabilize the transition state versus how much do I stabilize the end state. Yeah. And I'm going to hint that in a couple of minutes here, but we won't crack that until next week. But that's exactly where we want to get. Uh, so there are two types of states that I've shown. It. One of them is folding intermediates. And you can determine folding intermediates. The molten globula is a folding intermediate. We can not find the state. It might not be super well defined, but it's something that's semi-stable. It's not the best state, but it's a meth, you can actually call these meta-stable states. It is a local minimum in the free energy, so I can observe it. The transition state, on the other hand, by definition, I can't, I can't determine a crystal of the transition state. Balancing on the edge of a knife, it's a local maximum in the free energy. But the transition states will, of course, determine how fast things happen. So the problem with your residue, in the extreme case, this might not affect the transition, but what if I just destabilize the molten globular, right? Effectively, the barrier is lower. But that didn't necessarily change the, the transition. So it's, it's, there's something hard here. I need to check both the folding process versus the unfolding process, and then I might be able to separate that. So that the way to try to determine this is to look at this experimentally, what happens in folding and what happens in unfolding. But the problem is that now it's not structure, it's kinetics we want to look at. And there are a bunch of more or less advanced experimental methods to try to do kinetics. The simple one would be uh, stopped flow kinetics or continuous flow. And what you essentially do, you have a chemical here, A, and a chemical here, B. 
in two small syringes and as you push it here they mix and if you then have a very small here and very narrow test tube here like 0.1 millimeter or something as the liquid here is being pushed through this test tube well here it has only had time to be mixed maybe one millisecond two milliseconds three milliseconds four milliseconds so by choosing where to observe say fluorescence I can observe it as a function of time they have had to be mixed the only problem is it's going to be expensive because I have to keep adding more and more liquid here all the time, right, as I do the experiments. Um, but that makes it possible to get things, properties, for instance, fluorescence as a function of 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, 300 milliseconds. So I'm not just depending on one snapshot. I can determine it continuously as a function of time. And when you do that, you can try to then mutate residues and see what residues influence, for instance, the fluorescence and see which ones were early formers, at least. But that just tells me whether they were part of some sort of intermediate state or whether they helped to form the protein. It doesn't tell you whether they were part of the transition state. Because by definition, I can't observe the transition state. This would be only be local intermediates. So to understand this transition state, we, would, we need to go back to look at these barriers. And we already know that the speed with which things happen has to do with an exponential raised to the minus the free energy barrier divided by RT, right? So the higher the energy barrier is, the slower it happens. And just as we had on the slide before, but we might not have emphasized, there are two energy barriers we have to think about. It's either we go from unfolded to folded, then it's this barrier, or if we go from folded to unfolded, then it's the other barrier. And both of them are going to be important. So how do you determine these barriers? Uh, this is why I hate having given you slide copies because you can see I can't, it never surprise you. Uh, anyway, it's the building we are in that named after the person who got the prize, Nobel Prize for determining these barriers, Svante Arrhenius, a Swede. Uh, so he came up with the idea that, sorry, that, I'll move back. Do you see this whole, the temperature dependence here, this whole term is related to the temperature, right? So we can find the slope of how a, temp how a reaction changes with temperature. This is really the slope. This is the coefficient that determines how fast it changes with temperature. So what Svantarinius did is that if you plot this as one over the temp versus one over the temperature and how fast the reaction happens, the slope of this red or the blue line here is going to be the reaction going either from native to unfolded or from unfolded to native. And they can determine, from these you could in theory get your free energy barriers. And I know that's sorry, we, we spent two hours together, but if you give me two more minutes of attention. Uh, this is not entirely easy to measure independently, because if I have my native protein here, and then I keep adding some energy to un unfold it, the only problem is that some of those darn molecules that I just unfolded, they're going to fold back. So the problem is that it, and me, it goes both ways. So that for now you'll have to bear with it. Let's pretend that the second the molecule has unfolded, I could remove it from the sample and I wouldn't have to care about it. Maybe that it would become part of the precipitate or something. This is unfortunately the problem. Nobody uses this, hardly anybody uses this plot for protein folding. But if I could do it, if I could measure that curve independently from that curve, I would get the slopes from them. And if you could do this, unfolding makes a lot of sense. The more energy we add, the more heat we add, the higher the temperature is, the faster it goes. Like any other transition you would expect in a chemistry lab. It makes 100% sense. Folding, on the other hand, the more energy you add, the slower it goes. It behaves exactly the opposite way of any normal transition you would imagine. If you want it to happen faster, cool it down. And already here you start to see that the processes are, they're not the same type of barrier and process. And of course, now you kind of already have a hunt. Why it is that way? Let's see where, there. So you can actually determine the temperature dependence on this, and I'm not going to take you through all the math, but again, the temperature, we should just calculate what is the derivative here, and how does that depend on the temperature? Well, you're going to end up with, that is roughly constant, so we can forget about it. And then we're going to get the derivative of the free energy 
And the derivative of 1 over temperature, well, first we have to take the derivative of 1 over t, which is minus 1 over t squared, and then just the derivative of temperature. With Svantarihinius, we would just stop here and try to plot them as a function of each other. But this is now going to be a complicated expression where it's derivative of free energy related to temperature and 1 over t2. This is not something that I would recognize immediately, but if you sit down and do the math or look back into the book, what we did, there is a relation of the derivative of the free energy with respect to temperature, and that depends on energy. And if you evaluate this and put it, it's going to turn out that this temperature actually depends on the energy between two states. So that the larger the energy is, that's going to explain what the rate constant here is. Oh, sorry. And what this means is that, oops, my bad, too fast. What this means is that from the speed which this happened, we can determine what the energy difference is between these two different states. So that we need that the energy, bar the energy at the barrier, not the free energy now, but the enthalpy. The enthalpy at the barrier must be higher than the enthalpy at the native state, which is reasonable. The barrier is bad. You would prefer to be at the native state. But we also know that the energy, for the same reason, the energy of the unfolded state must be even higher than the barrier. So energy-wise, it's actually better to be at the barrier than at the completely unfolded state. And that corresponds to this curve I drew, right? That the energy drops all the way, continuously. You can do exactly the same argument with entropy. It's a slightly different equation, but based on what we know with the speed, the fact that protein folding slows down if you raise the temperature, we know that the entropy of the unfolded state is highest. The entropy of the barrier is actually better. But the entropy, uh, sorry, um, it's worse. And the entropy of the native states is by the worst of them all. And what that really gets to is this plot, is that the energy goes down monotonously, and the entropy actually also goes down monotonously. There is going to be more pronounced in a certain area, and that is what creates this. But the whole argument that folding, unfolding is an energetic barrier, we know that because unfolding goes faster the more energy you add. And we know that folding is an entropy barrier because we have exactly the opposite. The more energy you add, the slower it goes. Because we need to find those slower. So this is not just hand waving. We know from experiments that this must be true. So folding is about searching process, an entropic process, and that was all Leventhal was about. While unfolding and the stability has to do with energy. And the point is you need them both. As much as we hate the barrier when we're trying to fold, we would be in very bad shape if we were not stable there. The only problem is that this is completely useless. You can't measure it in the lab. Because for a large complicated protein, there is no way to remove the things that has unfolded. I can't unfold it and just look at the unfolding. I always look at folding and unfolding in mix. And there are ways to study this, and we're going to study them on Monday. Um, there's a bit, let's see, yes, I will, uh, two slides remaining, so we'll have time to do this. So what I would, the way you would like to study this is the equilibrium rates. So that in this process, how much, how fast are we in general? Are we net moving to the right or moving to the left? Now, the net process of moving more to the folded state, that's, of course, a sum of things that are folding and some of them that are unfolding or vice versa. If I am net moving to the unfolded state, that just means that there are more molecules unfolding than folding. But I really would like to do, I would need to sum this up. So that this equilibrium constant is really the ratio of how much is folding versus how much is unfolding. But those I can calculate. So the first one had to do with the going from folded over the barrier, and this one had to go being from folded over the barrier. So it actually turns out that the barrier doesn't enter there. It will only depend on the free energy between the two states. Because this, again, this is the equilibrium rate. Uh, sorry, this is equilibrium constant, not the folding rates. And this is going to determine if you wait an infinite amount of time, what fraction of the molecules are going to be folded in state B versus unfolded in state A. 
And then if we go through a math, and I'm not even going to try to go through this in details with four minutes remaining, uh, consult the book if you would like it. The way we would like to do as a function of time, how many molecules are still in the folded, in this case I just call them state A and B. How many of the molecules are in state A as a function of time? Well, that's going to be a sum of these things, right? The ones that I will remove the things that are moving over to B, and I'm adding the things that's coming from B to A. And then I can use these two equations because rather than say A and B, of course, depend on each other. The sum of A and B is constant because it's the total number of molecules. And then it turns out that I can start to reformulate that in terms of the number of molecules, the ratio I would have at infinite time. And if I plug that in, eventually I'm going to get an exponential. So, of course, the longer I wait, the more molecules have moved over from A. And at the very end here, the constant you get up here in the exponential is actually going to be a sum of the constant moving from left to right and right to left. It's very non-intuitive. And I'll do you a favor. You can forget about that after this slide. So why do I even show that? Well, I want to show that there is a way, because again, the k here, this was just an equilibrium constant. I would like to know how fast does the net process happen. And the net process, you can actually look at the sum, both of folding and unfolding at the same time. So it does work. And rather than worrying about Svantarhenius and trying to remove the molecules that have already undergone, we'll let the pro molecules do what they want to do. And then we'll just add up the rates. This is what everybody does in a chemistry lab. And if you do this, you end up with the curve that looks almost the same. But you're going to curve that goes down there, and then it changes shape and goes up again. So in this case, on the x-axis here, I have denaturant concentration, say, guanidinium hydrochloride. And, th and this is super strange. But the reason why this works, if I don't have any guanidinium hydrochloride, what will, the protein what will all the molecules do? They're going to fold, right? They love to fold. So up here, we're only folding. We don't care about the unfolding because we don't have any denaturant. So up here, it works really well. I can ignore the denaturation. If you have eight molars of guanidinium hydrochloride, you can pretty much forget about folding. Anything is going to unfold. So up in this region, everything is going to be unfolding. And the point is, if I'm, you see that this is even a logarithmic diagram. So if I am here, the contribution of that curve is negligible, and vice versa. So there's going to be a bit of complication around this midpoint. But let's not worry too much about that for now. But so these diagrams is they're called chevron plots. I think my, let's we, we have an illustration. It just comes from these signs you have in uniforms, and you recognize them because they always have this double this angle. This gives you two things. For any protein, give me one sequence, and then we test this as a function of unfolding. It could be a function of temperature, function of denaturant, function of anything else. And all I need to do is I measure how fast does it fold versus unfold. What does that get me? Absolutely nothing. Well, unless you like to know how fast your protein folds. But what if we now use your suggestion? Let's do one mutation here. What do you think is going to happen to this curve? They will start to move. And exactly how they move, we will look at next week. But in general, you're going to have, when you do lots of experiments like this, you're going to end up with a curve that has moved in some sort of way. And how much that angle is moving versus how much that angle is moving helps us know, was it primarily the folding we were influencing? Or the, was it was primarily the folding speed we were changing or the stability to unfolding? <coughs> And what that's going to help us do is tell us how much are we stabilizing the transition state in particular and the specific residue that you changed. Was that part of the transition state or not? And what this will help us to do is that we can identify the transition state. And this is super cool. We can't determine the structure of it. But I can know residue alanine 47 was definitely part of the transition state. I have no idea what it looks like. But I can say yes or no. Was this residue part of the transition state? So that indirectly, we can map out transition states. But that's going to be the topic for next week. Um, oh.
20 study questions. Um, things are moving up here. Um, I think we've actually covered all of these. Uh, work your way through them. Uh, if there is anything that you feel that I haven't covered, we'll talk about that on Monday morning. So what we're going to do next week, we will, the good thing, we're going to crack Leventhal's paradox even early next week. And then we're going to spend some time looking at real protein folding. Uh, we're going to spend some time looking at nucleic acids in particular. I might spend a little bit talking about our research. And then I forgot whether it's next week or the week after that, where I'm also gonna, deliberately going to take you all out to a study visit at SciLife Lab if you want to. Because I feel that we kind of wave SciLife Lab as a flag for you all the time, but you haven't really spent that much time there. Um, if you are in a specific labs, I will show you our labs, cryo-EM, electrophysiology, bioinformatics and simulations. If there is anything specific that you would like to know about, let me know and I can try to hook up another PI too. Uh, and then you're going to be doing more labs too. Lots of work, but enjoy the weekend instead.